Jesus. Come on, think about it. Think about it. That holy place where the presence of the Lord was so thick and so real, yet it was forbidden to enter into. You couldn't go in there. It was an instant death sentence for you to walk through that curtain into that most holy place where the presence of God dwelt so richly, so deeply. And yet can you fathom for a moment right here where you're at this morning in Poe in Arkansas, that weighty presence of God, what is called the kabod of God, is right here in this place. It's right here in this place. Because when Jesus was on that cross and he said, it is finished, it is done. And the Bible says that that curtain ripped from top to bottom and it separated, that there is no more any separation between us and the weighty presence of God that now we can come boldly into his throne, into his presence. Come on, somebody. We need to get in that presence. In that presence is where we are saved, delivered, healed, taken care of. Our peace is found in that place. Let's be in that presence. Oh, come on. Hallelujah. Father God, we thank you. We thank you for this moment. We thank you for that time that, God, we could come. That, Father, it feels like we walk through the gates of hell every day. It feels like we travel that road that leads right through hell every day. But yet, Lord God, we can be in your presence at any given moment by just worshiping you, by telling you how much we love you. Even right now, Lord God. Even right now where it may have felt like we had to walk through hell just to get to church this morning. We can know that we are in the presence of Almighty God. Right now. And God, I thank you for it. Lord God I need you right now I need you so much right now Lord this is holy ground we declare right now this is holy ground because this is your house and we are your people gathered in your presence in your name for your agenda Lord God this is holy ground hallelujah Father God, right now on holy ground. Right now on holy ground. This is our time and our place, Lord, to take off our sandals and to wait in your presence. And Lord God, we lay down everything. We lay down everything that we brought with us this morning. We lay down our hurts, our hang-ups, our habits. We, de- we lay down, Lord God, our sin. We lay down our struggle. We lay down, Lord God, the things that are hurting us, the things that are heavy on our heart. We lay those things down right now, Lord God. <clears throat> we lay them at an altar. Lord, this is our sacrifice to you right now. As we have given you of the best of our tithe and offering. As we have given you the best of our worship, Lord God. Now we give you the very best of what hurts us. We give you, Lord God, these things. They are hurts that are so intimate to us that sometimes we can't even tell somebody about it. But it's with us everywhere we go. God, we lay them down right now. Friend, whatever it is you're dealing with, this is a moment. This is a moment where you ask God to meet your need. Father, right now I got a son that's laying at home sick. God, I pray right now, heal his body. We've got several in our church that are right now sick. And God, we pray, heal their bodies. Raise them up, Lord God, so that they are sick no longer. And Father God, I pray right now, if there if an ounce of prevention is worth a pound of cure, God, I pray right now, let nobody else get sick among us. Let us be healthy so we can keep doing what we need to do during our week and so that we don't have to miss church on a Sunday because we're fine. And Father God, we lay down our relationships, our marriages. We lay down our finances. We lay down, Lord God, our struggles, our struggles that we have every day. 
Because, Lord God, if we are truly yours, then everything about us, all the good and the bad and even the ugly, Lord God, all of it belongs to you. And if it belongs to you, then, Lord God, I need to take my hands off of it. And God, I give it to you right now. Have your way, King Jesus. Have your way in our life. Have, our, have your way in our needs. Father God, what I declare is let your kingdom come and your will be done in our life. Let your kingdom come and will be done. Do what it is that you want to do right here, Lord God. Have your way, Jesus, right here. Because, God, we wait on you right now on holy ground. Jesus, we love you. Jesus, we love you. Jesus. Come on, just wait in His presence a minute for me. Let's not have any agenda right now. Let the Holy Spirit move. Lord, you're welcome to move here. Are you here today and you need a touch from the Lord? The Lord's stopping everything right now just for you. Is there something you need from God today? You need a touch in your body. You need a touch in your mind. You come here today carrying the weight of the world, and I'll tell you, God is ready to release you of that. If you're here tonight and you need a touch from God, would you just step out right now and come stand across this front? We want to pray with you. The greatest thing we could do today is minister one to another. If you're here and you need to be prayed for, come stand right here across this front. Thank you, Lord. God knew. God knew. And He's stopping everything for you. You are so important that this is on God's priority right now. Is there somebody else you have a need today that you need God to minister to? Then step out right now. I need my staff to come out right now. I need you to come and gather around these. We need to gather around these and we need to pray over them. Somebody else, you're here this morning. You say, man, I need God. I need God to do something great in my life. Come on, church, let's pray right now. Those of you that are seated, would you join me right now? Pray with me. Pray with me over these needs right now. Can I get a couple more men to come down here, please? Brother Rick, would you come? Let's pray.
those that are praying, I want you to continue praying. I feel like the Lord wants us to go ahead and move on. Before we do, let me just tell you, to all of our worship team and every one of you, let me just, and I want you to hear your pastor's heart this morning. Thank you. Thank you for letting this be a church where the Holy Spirit is free to move. Can I tell you, we have no other agenda when we come together than to let God be God. If God, can't, if God can be God anywhere, it ought to be in his own home. We, he doesn't get to do it in other places, but he can here. So thank you. I don't take that for granted. Thank you for allowing the Holy Spirit to move because I promise you, when you need him, he will move. He'll move for you just like he has for these here this morning. This month has been uh, sort of a special emphasis. This month, besides being Past Appreciation Month, this has also been a month that we've celebrated missions. I believe that if we're going to have a heartbeat like Jesus Christ, we have, a ha- we have to have a heart for missions. And God help us, church. Now listen. God help us that we should ever get to that point where we say, do we have to have one more mission service? Can I tell you, we are a missionary outpost right here in Poe in Arkansas. And God uses us to reach out literally around the world. And this morning we have a, a special guest with us. Brother Bill Hageman, and he's brought a couple men with him. Brother Hageman, him and his wife, traveled down to Central America. This is not a pastor. This is not a credentialed minister. This is a man who's done construction all of his life, who God simply said, go ye therefore. Let me tell you something. We're not safe sitting on that little red chair that you got and thinking, oh, that's the preacher's job. Can I tell you? God will call you right where you sit and say, go and be my hand extended. This brother, I got to know him. He lives in Atkins, Arkansas, and uh, um, got to know Brother Bill and his wife um, at our last church, and and they were reaching out to Costa Rica, and they've since moved to doing some work in Nicaragua. Men, I want you to pay specific attention to this because... Uh, we are planning to do a men's missions trip. Uh, um, we want to do that this spring, and this is the gentleman that we want to do it with. And uh, so I want you to hear him. I want you to see the pictures they have. But more than that, I want you to see what God is doing around the world, not just here, but he's doing it around the world, but he uses you to make it happen. Brother Bill, would you come? Church, stretch out your hand towards my brother right now. And let's pray over him. Father God, right now in the name of Jesus, we pray that you would be with Brother Hageman. And that, Father, let your words be his words, your thoughts be his thoughts. And, Father God, you use him. And open our minds and hearts because, God, it's very easy to get callous to believe all that, all that matters is what happens right here in Poe in Arkansas. And that, Lord God, it's our jobs, it's watching the Razorbacks, it's deer season, it's whatever our little world consists of. But truly, there is a greater world out there that's hungry to hear about Jesus Christ. And we have a part to play. We have an obligation and responsibility that we will stand before God and answer for, for what we have done and what we have not done. Use this man and let him touch our hearts in Jesus' name. Somebody said amen. Would you give a great big poem welcome, Brother Bill Hageman. Good morning. I appreciate your pastors. They're great people. I've known Brother Mike and Sister Andrea for a long time, several years, and I've never seen anything but good things out of their ministry. We serve a wonderful, loving God, a God who gave everything so that you and I would not have to taste spiritual death but have a a life that is vibrant, a life full of good things, a life that we can share with brothers and sisters for different color skin, different languages, 
Because God is not willing that any should perish, but that all should come to repentance through the knowledge, the saving knowledge of Jesus Christ. What he's done for us, what he's done for every man. And that even goes as far as ISIS. God's not willing that they die, that they perish. And it's a hard thing for someone like you and I to look at ISIS and say, hey, I'd like to see them in heaven. <laughs> it's a hard thing. But God is a God of love, and his love extends to every man. It doesn't matter how far down, how mean, how vile, how vicious they are. The love of Jesus Christ, the saving relationship with Jesus changes it all. And I ask that you'd open your hearts this morning just to listen a little bit to what we're doing. God has used uh, someone that's been a contractor for 49 years now. He's used uh, my wife and I in ministry in Mexico, Costa Rica, and now also in Nicaragua. And he's opened up a lot of doors for us. And uh, it's amazing that he can use someone like me. That's the way I look at it. But uh, the grace of God covers everything. The grace of God is sufficient. And, uh, you know, it's, it's hard to see how God could use someone that's imperfect to do a perfect task, to bring man to a perfect relationship with a God who has provided everything for their needs. You know, Second Peter 1, 3, and 4. And I, I always add a little, which doesn't change the meaning at all. But I, he says in Second Peter 1, 3, and 3 and 4, and I'll just give you a bit of it, but God says, I've given you already everything that pertains to life and godliness through the knowledge of him, being Jesus, through the knowledge of him who's called you to glory and virtue. You know, God has already given us everything we need for our needs, but he wants us to take that information. Could you turn that on? He wants us to take that information to the lost and dying world about all about us, and I want to share just a few things with you this morning. I've asked Brother R.C. Uh, some of you may know him. He's from Mardell Christian Bookstore in Little Rock. He's assistant manager there. And some, I'm the loud mouth. <laughs> some, sometimes been pastor. He's currently a assembly God uh, Sunday school teacher, adult Sunday school teacher. But you see, these are Jesus' words. Look in the red. He says, for us... And that's not just the pastor, and that's not just missionary. Each and every believer has an obligation to find a way to reach Poe in Arkansas, to reach this county, was Grant County? What? Grant County, to reach Arkansas, the United States, and the world for Jesus Christ. It's not optional. He says, go ye, it's a command. And... Uh, if you look right there, you know, I spend a lot of time on airplanes with people who, they Can think everything's fine. Wait. Huh? Can I make a comment there? Go ahead. I just want it because this is fun. It says to every creature, right? The word creature there in the Greek means that which is created. And when we were in Nicaragua, we were in a little Nazarene church that's over 100 years old. And every time I would get up to preach or teach, or anytime anybody else would get up to preach or teach, there was a blonde dog that would come in and lay down at the front step, or he'd go lay down by the pulpit, and he'd be there till we were done, and he'd leave. As soon as somebody else started speaking, he'd be back. He listened to every teaching, every sermon. You're being heard by someone or some part of creation at all times. Maybe the dog cry out like the rocks that cry out if we don't worship the Lord, huh? We had chickens. We had pigs. <laughs> oh, yeah. That's my uh, granddaughter's husband right there that drove me this, this morning. And she ministers with us in Nicaragua. And she got to preach to lots of chickens way back in the jungle with the howler monkeys and everything else. With the monkeys going on. Yeah, with the monkeys <laughs> howling in the background. She was ministering there. But the second scripture here, Acts 4.12, I was with on, on an airplane with a Jewish lady. And, you know, we started talking about the Word when I first got on the airplane with her. And everything's new, Old Testament, Old Testament, Old Testament. Oh, hmm, this is a Jew. <laughs> so we got to talking about the Word for a while. I said, well, you know, you can't go to heaven without Jesus. She said, 
The Word of God don't say that. I said, well, do you ever look at the New Testament? Hmm. That wasn't really something for her, but she said, no, but she said, the Word of God don't say anything about that. I said, well, I've got my Bible here. Let's look at Acts 4.12. Opened the Bible up, and she looked at it. She wouldn't talk to me no more. <laughs> but at least she heard that she has to have Jesus. Now, we're supposed to go further than just bring people to Christ. We're supposed to disciple them. And that's the discipleship is a whole lot more than just telling someone about Jesus one time. Amen. And uh, that's one thing that the church was asking us in Nicaragua this time. They wanted us to minister on discipleship. And uh, that's something that we went with the intention of all along. But we need to teach them everything that the Lord has commanded us. You know, not just you must be born again, but our lifestyle, our our beliefs, the provision for God, for us, and everything about the Word. That's what God wants us to teach. Wait, you keep going fast. Okay. <laughs> I don't want Because, see, I look up words. These are, these are the scriptures I had marked here. Uh, the word teaching there in the Greek means to disciple. Mm-hmm. It means to disciple. It means that we are to go into all of the world and disciple people to Christ that they can stay and disciple others and we can go on to another. So the, teaching is not just to teach them something. It is to be there, be with them, and disciple them to Christ. Okay, you'll see a, a map of Central America here. Oh, it's over here. You'll see Costa Rica is highlighted. We, that's where we really got started in Central America was Costa Rica. It's been there for like 14 years. We have a Bible school. We have many things going in, in Costa Rica, but we also started working now in Nicaragua for the last couple of years, two and a half years. And we're doing many things in Nicaragua, and we have intentions, have ambitions for a lot, of, a lot more things. And uh, I'll show you just a little of that as we travel this morning. You saw, anything else? Huh? <laughs> no, I'm good. Okay. I'll find something later. Okay. Uh, God has opened up many doors for us to work in Costa Rica. And we've worked as a, actually the national missions directors for the Assemblies of God of the nation of Costa Rica for the last... Well, for two and a half years, and uh, this is one of the tribal groups here, the Guayami tribal people right on the Panama border, and these are the kids there, and it, the Guayami are a pretty terrible bunch of people, really. If uh, They're the worst tribal group in Central America that I, of Costa Rica. They really mistreat their kids in many ways, and I don't really need to share that with too many folks, that, but... Um, we have a Bible school on that reservation of Coto Bruce for the Guaymi people. And uh, we actually built a school. My wife is in the middle there. She's one of the tribal <laughs> people, see. But we built a school there on the reservation of Coto Bruce. And it's a public school. And uh, I was propositioned by a leader of the Latin American Child Care Organization, which was an Assembly of God organization, to build a build a school for the tribal people there on the reservation. And I asked him why I would do that. He said, because it'll open up the schools. So we built that, and we were able to furnish all the teaching staff, Christian teachers for that school. And they wound up giving us every school on every reservation because of this. And we were able to put Christian Great teachers time. in every, every school. Uh, there on that reservation, we have the Bible school, as I mentioned. And this is Pastor Recalter. He's actually a Wesleyan pastor which means nothing down there. They all believe what's in the book. You'll never know a Wesleyan from an assembly or from any other. No. Uh, church affiliation means nothing. We got, uh, da- we got down there. I was, I was amazed. I, I have been assembly of God all my Christian life. And I, we, I knew we were going and, and we were going to have some assembly of God people there, but I got asked to go speak in several churches while we were there. Uh, apostolic, Pentecostal, A.G., uh, Independence, Nazarene, and you couldn't tell the difference when you went into the church. Uh, they played their music. They had they had enough amplification for about five thousand people in a church that would seat fifty or sixty, and they turned it all the way up. <laughs> I made a bad mistake. I went to minister at a church that we were doing construction on. Went to minister to the pastor that night. I sat right in front of the speakers. Yeah, you can't you do that. Never do that. You never do that in that part of the world. You but never- in every church. When the music started, we danced until it stopped. Everybody, it, it wasn't just 
about singing. It was about being involved in worship and dance and in song and in music. And they were all the same. You couldn't tell the difference, and it was amazing to me. You all start leaving at 12, or I got a few minutes. <laughs> okay, I, I was talking about Coto Bruce Sorry. and the reservations and the uh, Bible school. Well, this is where we're actually building our, our church Bible school structure here. So we did this about a little over three years ago. And uh, you'll see it's a pretty good-sized structure. It's um, the church that was there for the West End pastor just wasn't quite adequate. There's a lot of people that go to church there, and this was to be uh, used for both the uh, ministry school as well as the pastor's uh, church. I've been working with three tribal groups, and I'm just going to show you kids or whatever from the three tribal groups. This is actually the Bree Bree tribal people here. It's their kids. We've built uh, four or five churches on their reservation, two of them. Whole barns, one of them was a big red iron superstructure. It'll hold three or four hundred people quite easily. It's got an auditorium as big as this. And then when you're on the Quebecer Reservation, this is pretty well typical housing there. They raise their houses up high enough off the ground where they can let their hogs run into their houses. So they, the hogs will eat the snakes because snakes are really bad in that area. So this is a three different tribal areas for the three different uh, tribes in Costa Rica. Now we're going to get over into Nicaragua. I want to show you, this is our first actual uh, pastoral seminar a over two years ago we, we did in Nicaragua. And this is our graduating group. It's 330 some odd church leaders from every denomination from like 16 villages that attended for the week. These were the hungriest people for the Word of God I've ever seen. Amen. Yeah, I have never witnessed such a hunger for the Word of God before in my life. And this was a a great starting point for us for pastoral seminars, and we're going to continue to do them because we found out that the pastors know almost nothing. You know, it's really ridiculous that some of the things the pastors ask you, but they're in earnest when they ask you because you'd think a, a child of God the first day or two would realize some of the things that they ask questions about. I got, I got asked to, and it took me 10 or 15 minutes to explain to a young pastor the difference between agape and phileo love. They didn't understand the difference. Uh, it, it, they just, they've never had the teaching of the depth that they need. They, they know the gospel, but they need to get deeper to, to really reach who they need to reach. A lot of the pastors in that part of the world don't even have a Bible. Mm. A lot of them have had absolutely no training. And when we do our pastoral seminars, we feed everybody. This is just one of the photos from that session. We fed two or 3,000 meals that week, gave away between five and 6,000 Bibles. We did many things that week. It was a good week. This is our starting our most recent trip. Uh, this is the inside of a, the Assembly of God Church in Tola, Nicaragua. When I got there the first time, I met with Pastor Luis, and this is the inside of his church. That is the outside of his church. Looks pretty rough, don't it? This is uh, the AG Church, the main church, Ebenezer Assembly of God in Tola, Nicaragua. When I was there with them and you know, had some things worked out, I knew that uh, in two weeks that we were getting ready to come back, we couldn't do everything. So I, I went and purchased lots of supplies. I got the church to go ahead. You saw what was there a while ago. I got them to get all the outside walls up and get ready for us to put the roof on and, and move forward with the construction. And I got back, well, six weeks ago, five weeks ago, whatever it was, this is, they had actually got the outside walls up and ready for us. And Pastor Luis is the one in the purple shirt, the big guy on the left. He's a jolly pastor. He's a great man of God. I went too far. Yeah, there you go. Okay, uh, there's a pastor in Russellville, Arkansas, that... Easter, a year ago, lost a son in a terrible accident. And this family bought a lot of Bibles to give in memory of that son. And uh, this particular guy right here on my previous trip, when I went just fine fact-finding and I uh, worked out and paid some you know, money getting ready for the projects and stuff, 
This guy came to me. He said he had his Bible stolen. I didn't know the conditions, and I didn't know anything about him. But I said, when you see me again, I'll have you a Bible. I'll have you a Bible in my hand. So I got with him here and gave him the first Bible from this, this family. And I come to find out he had just lost his wife recently. Got three kids he had to leave with his family uh, six, seven hours away from where we were by car. His youngest child passed out or whatever at mama's funeral, fell over, hit the casket with his head, wound up with severe pressure on his eye, uh, on his brain. He went blind in one eye, had severe pain. This guy had not been able to find work, needed money for medical bills to get the testing done, had already found someone that was willing to pay for some surgery to help the child, but didn't had to have proof that he had the need. So anyway, we were able to come up with the money between us to pay for this medical testing so he could go ahead and move on. But it was really nice that this guy got the first Bible and all the, all the condition in his life that led to his needs. And I'm not dressed really that nice, but I'm, I'm working construction. He's, he's teaching this week. This is inside the church. We're at this point, we're putting up lights and everything. And I'll show you another picture too in a minute. This church is advancing on. We're still trying to finish this church as well as one other. Both of these churches are like 1,600 or 1,700 square feet that I want to show you. This was the outside whenever we left it here a few weeks ago. Needs stucco, needs windows, needs doors, needs ceramic tile. And a man who works for me in Costa Rica went to Tola and to Miramar this past week and got us a well put in for a church in a rural community that has no water. And Pastor Luis had moved on with the stucco, waiting on me to come back for the windows and doors. Uh, he's gotten stucco looking pretty good on the church and stuff. Not inside yet, but he's getting a lot of work done on the outside. Okay, that was the first church, the Ebenezer Church of Tola. There's a community just not far from Tola, and it's actually considered part of the same region. It's a, called Miramar, which means view of the sea, look, look at the sea. This is Pastor Eduardo, who is a pastor in the Assembly of God of Miramar. And uh, when I meet him, he's got a little pole barn, a mission church that he's uh, pastoring. This is what it looks on the, like on the outside. This is where he wants to build his church. So, again, I know when we come back in two weeks' time, we'll never get a, a church that he wants with all the concrete work and everything completed. So I asked him to get his church started, to bring a crew in and get things going for us. Anytime he sees something, he can speak. Yeah, I will. <laughs> I'm waiting. And whenever we get back on this previous trip, they had the foundation in and uh this is the end of the first day when we got there. I got them to bring field dirt in, which I should have been there when they brought it because it was in bad shape. How many guys are in construction here? How many? Okay. There's one. <laughs> you got hey. a few construction guys here? Okay. Anytime you fill a, a slab, you know you need to have someone involved that can at least get things halfway leveled up when they're putting the dirt in because it sure saves a lot of effort. Well, they didn't do that. And me and I had Robert Tullis from Pope County, Arkansas go with me. He's a concrete contractor, and he and I wound up moving rocks, piles of dirt and everything else, trying to level that foundation up where we can get ready to put a slab in, and we're getting ready to put walls up. So, And everything is set up for earthquake standards there. You have bond beams around many times. This particular structure will have four sets of bond beams where you're concrete, you know, concrete reinforcing with steel. And you have steel rebar piers with concrete, like every 10 foot all the way around the building and everything. And we use a, a huge amount of steel down there. You've got steel everywhere in these structures to keep them from falling down in the earthquake. And 
and in, in this two-week period of time, we wound up having lots of things going on, lots of illnesses, <laughs> which is one thing. But we also, this particular church we're building here, there was one of the church family had lost a son that week in a motorcycle accident, caused the church crew to be out with us. They, they weren't there with us. We had lots of things going on, so we didn't get as far as I had wanted to. But whenever I left, See I See all these kids? We had, we had two construction workers, one electrician and Robert, and, and, and big husky guys, and, and they just, the last day we were there, they were both brought to their knees in, in tears by these kids. One of the, the little 13-year-old girl's name was Yancey. We're sitting there on the last day. And I'd been trying to teach her English, and she'd been trying to teach me Spanish, and I learned no hablo espanol, and she said, uh-uh. <laughs> but the last day there, and, and all the kids were this way, it was father. She never knew her dad. She adopted me as her father. We had, we had one little boy. They can't say R.C. In, in Spanish. They have trouble with my name. <laughs> but had one little boy. He decided he was going to make it, and it would go, <laughs> and by the last day he got it out, he would go, <laughs> and, and then just get tickled. Well, I watched him go over, and, and, he, and he hugged one, the electrician, and the electrician just, Grr. and by the time he got to me, my shirt was soaking wet. Uh, they just got so close and so under your skin, and when y'all were singing, or when we were singing on holy ground, Something struck me that, that I, I, I just really feel like I need to tell you. You and him and he and you, this isn't holy ground. You are. You are. When you go into all the world, you're going as holy ground. Do you understand that? When you're there, they are drawn to you. And they fall in love with you because you represent something more than yourself and it's holy ground that we take with us and touch those people I won't call her I don't like Saint Francis of Assisi and I, I, I found this just before I went to Nicaragua we had it on a t-shirt <laughs> he said we should be preaching at all times and when absolutely necessary use words it is that holy ground that goes with us that touches and reaches people and makes a difference. Sorry, Bill. That's no problem. <laughs> Whenever we left, coming back to the States on this last trip, like I said, this church hadn't progressed as fast and as far as I wanted to. But we had a man right there which is in a striped shirt that was a great worker. He was really good at coordinating everything, and I got him off to the side. I don't make a habit of paying people to work on their own church, but I knew that at the point we were, unless we got someone to help, it wasn't going to happen until I got back. So I asked him what he normally got paid a week for working, and he told me, and I hired him for two weeks to complete this church to the point I had expected it to be before we left. And I, I'm going to show you pictures. You know, everything we do, we do to be a blessing for the kingdom. We hope to do things to help people to see that God really cares. I should have given you a little bit more history about the church at Ebenezer in Tola. I don't know if you really noticed how little was done when we got there. There's a few brick walls standing, and the, the roof was about to fall off the church. There was a woman that was there that I talked to. Everything that she could do to raise an extra cordoba, which is, takes 26 cordobas to be a dollar. Yep. You could take three cordobas and buy a brick. She'd go make some pastry or whatever and sell it to buy two or three bricks for the church. And she'd been going to church there five or six years, and they had the walls up like this, you know. That's about it. They've been praying to God for a miracle. We are their miracle, you know. God hears that prayers of his people and he he sends people my main focus is not construction i do anything i can to bring people to christ that is my purpose we do medical missions we do whatever it takes we do evangelistic campaigns we we work in the christian schools whatever whatever we can find to lead people to christ and we found that 
some of the most productive has, has been medical missions. We've done medical missions before. We have like 1,700 people we'd see on one weekend, and we have 650 people find Jesus. And that's pretty good. That's pretty good. But I found out in all the things that we do in bringing people to Christ, there is no discipleship. There's just no way to get the discipleship to happen the way you need it to happen. So we're starting to train pastors, and we, our intention is to build a, trastor, a pastoral training facility where we can instruct people in the Word to where they really know what God intends for people. In that part of the world, everything is about me. Every, every pastor you see want to see what I can get in my pocket, you know. That's not Jesus. That is not Jesus. And if they ever find out that everything about God is give, 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 give and you shall receive. It's not receive, receive, and receive, and then maybe you can give. It's give first, then receive later. It's seed time and harvest. So that's our main focus lately has been to try to train pastors, and we're trying to also provide adequate churches and facilities for pastors. We're, we're, we're giving out thousands and thousands of copies of the Word of God. But it, everything hinges on our understanding of our covenant, what God provided for us through Jesus Christ. And if we ever understand what God has furnished for us, then we can move into the kingdom principles and establish other people as we disciple them, we can establish them in the, in the ministry of the Word. Praise God. We, we, I, I was privileged. I, I got to go as a teacher, but I also got to do a little construction because he wouldn't let me have a day off. Uh, <laughs> some of the other folks got to go to San Juan and do other things, but I went to the churches and, and worked. But I, got, I, I was privileged to be in, in two four-day pastoral seminars with church leaders. The, the first church, I was telling the pastor, it would be the equivalent of this church there, right? Mm -hmm. and, and it has a real pretty wall facing the street, and then there's no wall here, no wall here, no wall here. You're still pretty right now. Okay, praise God. <laughs> but we got to, to be there with almost 300 people, over 80 pastors from 25 different denominations. And they sat patiently for eight hours a day and would listen to one of us at a time come. Uh, so hungry, wanted so much more, and they would come when you were done. You got to come to my church. They would actually call all of their church members or get a hold of all of their church members to have a fresh service that night that wasn't planned for us to be there, and they would still get 60 and 70 people there that just came hungry for God, and I got to preach in churches for two and three hours. I was in heaven. <laughs> <laughs> But they're just so hungry for the Word of God. I've gotten emails in, in Facebook from pastors. Now, pastors, and I'm not. I'm, I'm not a pastor. I'm just a lay worker as far as I'm concerned. You've been pastor. I have pastored, and I've been a prison ministry and all that kind of stuff, and I just love the Word of God. But they offered to, to pay my room and board and my transportation, Wouldn't pay, couldn't pay me money, but if I would come for a year and teach eight hours a day, that's all they wanted, to be taught. They wanted somebody there to teach. And, and it is so precious to be there and get to share the word of God and see people saved and see demons cast out and see people healed uh, because they come believing it's going to happen. Our, our problem here, I think, is we come hoping it will happen. We, we, I had a friend who died not long ago, but he was healed of three cancers, and, and God gave him an extra four years, three or four years. And what I always admired about him is what I saw in them. When, when God told him he was healed, he said, okay, I'm not taking chemo anymore. I'm not going to the doctor anymore. I'm healed. And two years later, they couldn't find any of that cancer in him again. And that's the way those people approach the Word of God. When you say it, they believe it, and they accept it, and they get it inside, and they just need more of it. Uh, we need to be there all the time. Uh, I, I've come to the realization that missionaries go and set something up, and then they go away and, and go to the next place. And the next place, they're always moving. But it was just so phenomenal to be with them in their churches, in, the, in these seminars, and, and get to teach. And, 
one little girl turned to me. I, I, I was up speaking, and I sat down, and she, she said something to me, and I turned around and said, no hablo espanol. She said, I speak English. <laughs> I said, really? She said, yeah, I just want to know more about Jesus. I want to know who Jesus is. And I only took one Bible with me, only one, one of these. And, and, and as we talked, I got to share Jesus with her, and, and she began to be drawn to Christ. And, and she just kept saying, I just need more of Jesus. And I said, then you need to read about him, and you need to do it in English. And I gave her my Bible. Then she turned to me, and she says, this is the first time I've ever spoken English in public. I'm taking it in university to learn how to be an interpreter. She answered the altar call. She got up there, everybody walked around and they were praying for her and she just, she had her hands in the air, but you could just tell. And I just walked over to her and I put my hand on her head and I leaned over and I said, honey, just let go, God will take care of it. She's on the ground, she's accepted Christ, she came up speaking in tongues, okay? That's the way the people are there. We just need more people to be there to share the good news. It's, you need to all go with us. <laughs> you need to, there's a baseball field right next to where we stayed in the hotel we could rent that and y'all could go and we could have a really big <laughs> seminar uh it, it's just amazing and, and i don't care if you give him any money just come with us come with us we need the help we need the people there to to join us and reach these communities and I promise you, you will be blessed. I don't speak a word of Spanish, but I sang songs in Spanish in every church I was in. And I'd, tell, I'd get up, the first thing I'd say, I'm really trusting y'all that I was worshiping God because I have no idea what I just said. <laughs> but, but you just, the presence of God is everywhere you go because you take him with you. You take him with you and you're sharing him and then everybody else, oh, it's amazing. I better shut up. I'll keep us here. All, uh, I, He's I, talking I, about our hotel. <laughs> I got a blessing there. There was a night watchman that I watched in the background for the week. You know, I've been there a week already. And I kept noticing him, you know, going around in the background at night, watching it, everything for us and so we'd be safe. So I, I speak moderate Spanish, but not good enough that I want to share everything with people. So I went and talked to him a little bit and found out that his wife and kids are Christian, but he's not. He said, I work hours that don't allow me to to participate in worship services and stuff. So I asked him if he would like to know Jesus as his personal Savior. I told him, I said, God's more concerned about your relationship with him than he is about your attendance in church. I said, you know, you need to be in church, but if you can't be in church, God's more concerned about you than you, than you going to church. And... uh so he said, yes, he wanted to have Jesus in his heart. So I went and woke my interpreter up because this is way before there. I get up. When I'm down there, I may not sleep two hours a night. You know, I'm up studying or something most of the time. So uh, for the rest of the week after that day, I prayed with him for salvation. The rest of the week, he'd bring me cakes in the morning or <laughs> something. You know, he was a happy man. And I gave him a Bible. He was a happy man with that, too. He was that. He was a happy man. He was that. Okay. A little bit more about this church. I'll show you several different pictures of construction. Can I share the light switch with him? Yeah. <laughs> we, 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 to get this wall up, we had to tear half of the, 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 the old whole church. barn down. And, and when we were tearing it down, we found their light switches. <laughs> Coolest light switch I ever saw in my life. And I was in the electrical business for years. It was a syringe, like you'd give a shot with. <laughs> I, I have this picture of an electrician going to turn on the lights and having to twist wire going like this. So he, kept, he got syringes, and he came in the needle side with, with a, a wire and bent it up and put one in through the plunger side, and you went like this and turned the lights on. <laughs> <That's awesome. laughs> and you just pulled it apart to take it off. We got it really hard, don't we? <laughs> Church of Miramar. We now have handicap ramp. We have steps. Okay. Yay. Water. 
<laughs> Miramar is a very, very dry community. To build a church, we had to haul water about six miles from the river. So I agreed also, made a commitment for a water well. This was a very expensive venture. <laughs> I'm still in the hole right now. I'm hoping with one man in Russellville who donated, he said that God told him he was supposed to supply the well. I didn't think there was any way you'd run past $8,000, so that's what he gave. I'm at 11, almost 11, five. In the well, pump, electrical wiring, all the tubing, $11,500 for a well. That's ridiculous. But they have water now. They have pitcher. water all year. They were out of water two, three to four months out of the year. Would have to go to the river when they could or find water somewhere. Yeah. Now they're, they have water. Their the wells are shallow, 30 to 40 feet. They hit solid rock, and it just dries up certain times of the year. There's my babies. This is their, <laughs> our kids in Miramar. And that's one of the beauties of the country. And this is a typical kitchen for one of the church attendees. This is her kitchen and dining area. There's her cook stove in the back, dining table in front. And there's the lady. She was a faithful lady to help every day at the church. This is the delivery service for the local hardware store, a local place we bought most of our materials. And local transportation for people who want to go about town. This guy was instrumental in us being able to do our pastoral seminars. He was a pastor for 40 years in Rivas, Nicaragua, and he was over their ministerial alliance. He was the leader of all that, and he helped us put it all together. I'm trying to, there you go. This is a church he was talking about a while ago. The pastor here allowed us to have his facility, and he left on a mission trip for Honduras, and we didn't see him anymore all week. He did not know me and trusted me enough with this church. See, no walls. <laughs> yeah, you'll see it even better here. This is other views of the church. This is really one of the nicest ch churches in the area, one of the nicest yeah. churches in Rivas, Nicaragua. Rivas is a town of about, I think, 60,000 people, about a quarter million people live in the area, in that county, or canton, I think they call them. This is another view inside the church. And really, this really worked well because it's a hot there, and with the metal roof and everything, this kept you halfway cool. Anytime you want to speak, you can. But <laughs> I took with me good ministers of the Word. This is my sister. She's been an AG pastor for a long time. And the interpreter to the left. That's Dennis Miranda. He was, a, he, he was my favorite interpreter. This guy, he could... Every inflection, every move I made, he was right with me. It got to a point by the end of the time I was turning around on him just to make him run into me, just for fun. He graduated from Harding University in Searcy. <laughs> really, it's really. Father pastors church in, uh, in Managua, Nicaragua. This is this guy right here. And Danny Nick, and me, I'm not nothing special, but I was there. This was the first week that my granddaughter hadn't made it yet. She only made it for one week, and this is where we're giving, getting ready to give out our Bibles at the end of the week. And uh, we gave everyone that attended a Bible, but we gave all the pastors a Thompson Chain reference in Spanish. Everything's in Spanish in that part of the world. It was like gold to them. Yeah. We, we kind of take these for granted. It's a week's pay. A week's pay won't buy a Bible down there. For a lot of people, that's true. For a lot of them, it, it just won't. I mean, it's Bibles are like gold, and, and for them to get one in their hand and see, the, they just light up when they got it. It was really, really cool. This is one of our groups of pastors that's at the end of the first week receiving, the receiving their Thompson Chain references. This is what we're feeding the bunch. Like I said it before, we feed the, everyone we're teaching every day, and I wound up having to cater all the meals so that the local church people could all attend if they wanted. Hmm. At the, uh, what? 
Oh, I just like this. This was... <laughs> we got to be on an hour-long TV show. Live. Live TV. They, they, re, they was live, then they recorded it again on Sunday. They, they invited us to come and be interviewed. And their idea of an interview was to pin a mic on you, turn the camera on, say, okay, talk. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I thought I was going to be interviewed, and uh, I wound up just uh, ministering the word for, for a while. Oh, we got our Muslim in there. And uh, this is at the invitation of the Assembly of God, King of Kings Church of Rivas, Nicaragua. Iglesia Rey de Reyes, haciendo discípulos. We were making disciples. That's what we were doing. That's their program, and we were online for an hour, then the next day we rebroadcast. This is my granddaughter that went with us also, and she ministers a word. She's a great minister. And she was actually at this particular point way back in the, the jungle, mm -hmm. and this is the interpreters just trying to get a photo of all of them together. This chicken's running in and out all the time. She's ministering into the church because it's just a pole barn. And the monkeys in the background, you hear a howling. And this is the second week's teaching area. This is a uh, Nazarene church over in uh, Total Nicaragua. And the ministry time. I don't want to hold y'all too much longer, so I won't have to get y'all out of here. But this is just where we're working and teaching. Another beauty of the country. Every evening after our time of sharing with the pastors it's time then to try to get to the churches we're going to minister at at night so we had many different routes sometimes it's in the back of a pickup sometimes if you're fortunate you'll be inside of an SUV like that one sometimes they pick you up on a motorcycle <laughs> sometimes you'd walk to church you never knew when it came to church time where you were headed and what you were doing or you're going in and this is the location I told you about where she's out in the country out in the jungle, this is the church. And our team for this trip. And we were, at this time, we were at a decent place of lodging and had decent food each day, which is not always typical. And our free day, we went to some of the beauty of the area, which we always try to take our team members on a, a day of fun. That's Lake Nicaragua, yeah. That's Lake Nicaragua. They have sharks in the freshwater lake. Yep. Questions? Questions? No questions. I hope I didn't bore you too bad. God uses many ways to reach people for him. And he uses people like us, people like everything. Every type of person you think of in some form or fashion has got an access to ministry. God uses everybody in different ways, you know. And, uh, I just try to be usable for God. And uh, Anyone that likes to go on missions trips, you know, if they have a particular area that they would like to be involved in, if you would like to be involved in construction, we'd make it happen. If you like to minister the word, we do it all the time. We make it happen. If you want to be involved in medical missions, we do that too. We can make that happen. You know, every way possible that God can find a way to meet man on his own turf, God uses that, and he uses imperfect people to accomplish that task. It means God can use you. He uses us. Praise God. It I encourage you to go with us. Uh, I'm not the money guy. He is. I encourage you to go with us. I, this was my first mission trip. I had to get a passport. I've never been out of the country before except to Mexico once before I had to have a passport. But it was my first. And, and while we were in Rivas, I, I did not want to come back home to my wife and my grandkids and my great-grandkid. I wanted to stay. <laughs> I was ready. I wanted to stay. And, and until we got to Managua, and I, and I knew, okay, it's over. Now I'm ready to go. Uh, it was really, really hard to leave because I have so many brothers and sisters in Nicaragua now that, that I have got to meet and be with, and they have become so very special to me. 
and I want to see them grow and mature. Uh, you know, I'm on Facebook, and, and most of what I get on Facebook now I can't read because it's all from them. <laughs> uh, so I have to have people translate it. I'm, I'm working on a website for Bill, so we'll be up and running with a website. Uh, if you want to go and, and see some of the sermons and messages in, in while we were there, you can go to rc.littlerock on Utah, that, YouTube. That's my channel, and I've, I'm uploading video almost every day now of, of, the, of things that happen down there, the churches and the progress and the, the chickens and the pigs and the, the horses. And the, the, you know, when they delivered the sand for the churches, it was in, in ox carts. They, they still use ox carts and horse-drawn carts. Uh, and it's just, they're your brothers and sisters, and they need you there. Uh, if you can give into this ministry, praise God. If you can come with us, praise, praise God. Because uh, it's really as important for you to be there as it is to give to be there. Uh, God called us all, all. Now, it starts at home and grows out. But if, if you ever have the chance to come with us or someone else, Go and go expecting God to go with you and to show up and do mighty, mighty things. I had probably 30 or 40 pastors on a, on a platform in Nicaragua. They came up to the platform. I had them. I did an altar call for them. I just wanted to pray with them. And, and my interpreter came over and says, you need to do this. So I did. Those of you who are ready to give up, who are burnt out, who, who just can't do anymore, come up here. And half of them came to be prayed for and to be prayed over. And, and it was just amazing because God just opened eyes and, and, and I knew what to pray for. The other people up there, they knew what to pray for for that pastor. And in the next church I went to, uh, the guy came and got me. I thought he was a pastor. It turned out it was a lady pastor. And they took us in and set us down in this room. I, said, I felt like I was in the principal's office. And the lady came in and she sat down and through the interpreter, she said, you are so funny. You're a comedian. Uh, uh, <laughs> if you go watch one of those videos, you'll see I run all over the place. Um, but she said, your words stuck in my heart. I was ready to close my church and leave the ministry. I was burnt out. I was not seeing that any good was happening. And then when you came up and prayed for me, you prayed into me exactly what I needed to hear. And I said, how'd you know what I pray? You don't speak English. She said, your interpreter told me. I said, okay, I didn't know he was there. Uh, but it was that over and over and over and over again with pastors. And I'm not talking about people who don't know Christ. I'm talking about people who, who are preaching Christ. They need us to show them the way, to, to grow and to to be able to run a church in peace and enjoy and enjoy. These people have nothing. They have nothing. A piece of candy would light up those children's eyes because it might be the only one they get for a year. But they always had a smile on their face. They were always full of, of, of joy, if nothing else. Uh, it, it just... They were, a, they were a blessing to be around, and then we got to bless them back. So whatever you can do or whenever you can go, please come. Praise God. I know that you have a, a, a desire to, to get your church as a whole to participate in maybe a construction project for the country. So, you know, when you get together, your men, if they really want to do that, just tell us what you want, and we'll make it happen, you know. And um, I don't know what kind of budget your church can can come up with for projects. You know, if you want to build a church, if you want to just go in and remodel some, just whatever. Just just let us know what you want. We'll we'll make it happen for you. You know, and you'll you'll see how big a blessing you can be with how little it takes. To, you know, to make that blessing happen for these people. They are a simple people, and they're ready for the word. They're hungry for the word. And they're ready for Jesus to, to be number one in their lives. And they, they worship God with a zeal like you've, you don't witness very often. You just don't have to see it happen. Yeah. All right. Yeah, okay. Thank you.
Thank you, Brother Bill. Here's what I want us to do. Um, uh, Brother Ricky, Brother Norman, would you guys grab a bucket and just stand by the door? And this is how I want us to close today, by doing a little something to touch our world. We do our very best to touch our area, but we need to be a people who touch our world. And you heard him say it, that for a few pennies, you could buy brick. For a dollar, a dollar would buy, uh, let's just say, 20 bricks. I mean, it's, it's relatively that inexpensive for us, but very expensive for them. For every dollar that you can give today, that's 20 bricks that this little lady was trying to sell pastries and cupcakes to try to build a church, something that we take for granted here, that they'll never have something like this. But they need something. They need people that will go and are willing to represent Christ with them and for them. So just bow your heads with me right now as we get ready to leave. And Father, we say thank you for this ministry that the Hagemans have. Thank you, Lord God, for what they do. Thank you that, that uh, they're able to go out to the highways and byways of other parts of the world. But, Father, we do it as well. We do it through our giving. We do it through our praying every week. When we pray for another nation, we pray for a different nation every week. And that, Father, we are doing that. We are giving. We're praying. And, Lord God, I'm believing that we can be sending. That, Lord God, you can send us to do short-term missions trips. Maybe you can even raise up missionaries out of our church. That, Father, we can see our young people uh, going off and becoming missionaries around the world. Father God, I pray right now, help us to do our part. That, Lord God, while we may feel like we have so little, Lord, truly, we have so much. And God, I pray right now, your blessings go with us, watch over us, help us have a wonderful afternoon. And God, we pray that you would bring us back together tonight for a great time of your word again in your presence. That, Father, let your spirit move across this world until Jesus comes again. And, Father, we give you the praise in Jesus' name. Somebody said amen. Stand with me if you would. Turn to somebody, shake their hand, hug their neck. Be sure and come by and see Brother Bill Hageman and R.C. They have a table out there in the foyer with some literature. Stop by and see that. And uh, we're going to be looking at a missions trip this spring. I'll give you more details on that. The guys are standing outside with buckets. Every dollar you can give as a love offering uh, helps build churches in Nicaragua. God bless you. We'll see you all tonight at 5 o'clock.